morning. It's good to, good to see you today. Um, this being a summer weekend, I know we have some folks out of town, and we probably have some folks here visiting. And it's good to have you here. And if you're from the community, we're really excited to see you here. We just hope you'll come back with any opportunities to have. Uh, if you didn't pick up a bulletin this morning, try to do that before you leave. There's several items in there. Uh, don't forget about uh, uh, Matthew 4.4 4, uh, that will be coming up this week, this Thursday, uh, June the 17th at 5 p.m. Tonight, for you ladies, uh, it is ladies' night. Uh, salads and desserts, that starts at 6. And be sure and bring your Bible to that as well. Uh, the, uh, Vacation Bible School will be uh, July the 11th through the 14th. There's a note about t-shirts. Uh, Tracy Franklin needs orders and money uh, for those t-shirts by June the 23rd. Children pre-K through 5th grade attending VBS will get a free shirt. Adults and workers who would like a shirt uh, pay Tracy $13. Make that out to the church. This year's theme is our faith is over the top. So it'll be fun to get back to that after missing it last year, for sure. Don't forget about uh, our summer series. Uh, this week will be Josh Parnell. He's, he's been here several times and always does a great job uh, when he comes to, to speak. Congratulations to uh, Frank and Alice. They're here today. They were married yesterday, so uh, not quite 24 hours yet, but it's getting close. So good to see you. Remember Brenda Doris, uh, she'll go June the 16th for consultation in St. Louis for nerve pain. Sharon Wilson's been very ill in the hospital uh, in Memphis. Uh, Rebecca Ross's grandson's mother, uh, Whitney Longshore, is very ill in the hospital with COVID, with pneumonia, actually. So uh, remember her. And there are, there are several others that are listed uh, who are shut in or who are having difficulties and those who are undergoing treatment so forth, so be sure to remember them as well in your prayers. I think that's all the announcements I have. Uh, Dennis Blake has our opening prayer this morning, so let's remember him. Let's pray together. Our dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that you allowed us to be here this morning. We're thankful for you here today for the blessings and health that we enjoy, for all the blessings of this life that we enjoy, but especially for the spiritual blessings you've given us through your Son, Jesus, and it's for that reason that we've gathered today. Father, we pray that you would be with those who have been mentioned who are ill, uh, give them uh, strength, give them recovery, if it's your will. Be with us this morning as we enter into this time together. <laughs> to be encouraging to one another. Father, thank you so much for the example that Jesus left for us on how to live, how to treat one another, and how to spread your kingdom. Please help us to do just that each day of our lives. Please watch over us this morning as we enter into this time. In Jesus' name we pray. The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. He makes me down to lie. In pastures green, he leadeth me. In pastures green, he leadeth me. The quiet waters by my soul he doth restore again and me to walk doth make within the paths of righteousness within the paths of in for his own name's sake. Yea, though I walk in death's dark veil, 
yet will I fear not ill, for For thou art with me, and thy rod and staff me comfort still. My table thou hast furnished in presence of my foes, my head. My head thou dost with oil anoint, and my cup overflows. Goodness and mercy all my life shall surely follow me. And in God's house forevermore, my dwelling place shall be. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Keep silence, keep silence, keep silence before him. Before Jeff uh, shares some thoughts with us surrounding the Lord's Supper, we're going to sing this song uh, together. Um, four verses of this song. Of course, this was written a hundred years ago, or just about that. Um, when that happens, there's a lot of language that's used that that is not common to us every day. You and I talk. A lot, a lot of these uh, terms and words. It's important. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14, uh, about verse 15, he said, he said, I want you to sing with your spirit, but also you have to know exactly what it is that you're, that you're singing. And so as we, I just want to briefly look at the words of, of this song uh, before we sing it. It says, Midnight and on Olive's brow, you know, the brow is the crest of a hill. Jesus went out to the Mount of Olives. If you've grown up, if you've grown up uh, uh, knowing this story, some of these some of these things are a little more more obvious uh, than they might be if uh, to the newer Christian. Uh, he went to the Mount of Olives, and so he's, he's on the on, on the Mount of Olives, Olives Brow. The star is dimmed that lately shone. What's that all about? That's a poetic way, I believe. The author is saying that, that uh, the brightness of Christ. If there was ever a time it was dark in his life, it was at this moment. When he, when, he, when he was praying in the garden. And this is a word picture of, of that episode. It is midnight in the garden now, the suffering Savior prays alone. Verse 2. It is midnight and from all removed. He left his disciples and he went a stone's throw away and fell down to pray. So when we sing, he was from all removed. That, that, and when I was a kid, that was always an interesting uh, passage to me until I thought about it that way. The Savior wrestles alone with fears. Even that disciple whom he loved. Who's that? It's going to be John. Peter, James, and John. John was the disciple that, that Jesus loved. Even, even his best, maybe the one he was closest to, if we had to say, from what information that we have. Uh, he was falling asleep. He was falling asleep when Jesus was at his having his worst time and his biggest struggle 
ever. Even that disciple didn't hear his master greet him by tears. Verse 3. It is midnight, and for others' guilt, the man of sorrows weeps in blood. We'll continue. Yet he that has an anguish knelt is not forsaken by his God. That, that verse is fairly self-explanatory. And look at verse 4. It is midnight, and from ether plains is born the song that angels know. Ether plains. Ether Plains was, uh, uh, during the time that this was written, was uh, uh, there was a great discussion about things that were going on in a, on an earthly plane, and then what about the heavenly, the, the heavenly plane? And that's that's what uh, that's what this has has reference to. Ether Plains. It's not a biblical term that I'm aware of, and yet think about what was going on on a spiritual level with Jesus and his Father at the time that he's, he's praying this, and, and the author is poetically pointing out. Something's going on there. From either planes is born the song that angels know. There was some interaction going on that even we, we try to weakly understand. But we can't really understand the depth of what was going on between Jesus and his Father. Unheard by mortals are the strains that sweetly soothe the Savior's will. Whatever that communication was, God took care of his son and supported him during that time. And... Uh, and minister to him as we know from scripture. We'll sing this and uh, enter into our time of Lord's Supper. Tis midnight and dawn of his brow the star is dim that lately shone Tis midnight in the garden, now the suffering Savior prays alone. Tis midnight, and from all removed, the Savior wrestles long with ears in that disciple whom he loved heeds not his master's grief and tears tis midnight and for Guilt the man of sorrows weeps in blood, yet he that hath in anguish knelt is not forsaken by his God. Tis midnight, and from ether plains is born the song that angels know, unheard by mortals are the strains that in Titus chapter 2 uh, Paul uh, instructs Titus on the teachings of various groups uh, amongst the church what to teach the older men what to teach the the older women, uh, how the older women should be examples to the, the younger women, uh, so how how each of us teach one another in a sense, uh, so what to teach the younger men, and as the older men are exemplifying this through their lives, then that's being taught to those who observe it, and as the older women are exemplifying these teachings in their lives, and the younger women learn, uh, and so forth, so uh, we truly do teach one another not just by word, but uh, maybe much more so uh, in many ways uh, 
on how we actually are living. Paul really makes this a point uh, when he talks about, in verse 9, uh, what to teach slaves. Uh, he tells them to be subject to their masters, not to steal, but to show that they can be fully trusted. For this reason, he says, so that in every way they will make the teaching about God, our Savior, attractive. You ever thought about how you live out your Christian life and how I live out my Christian life? in terms of its attractiveness to people uh, and how we can attract Jesus to Jesus uh, to uh, Jesus' teaching, or we can maybe turn them away to simply on how we live, no matter how much we might know, uh, but by the example that was set uh, from day to day. And then he talks about grace. Um, grace is something we talk about a lot, you know, the unmerited favor. It's that, that gift that we receive when we don't deserve it. We, don't, we haven't earned it. Uh, it's something that, that's uh, received through the cross. And the cross is where grace begins with Jesus there uh, and dying on the cross. But in verse 11, he says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self controlled, upright, and godly lives. In this present age grace teaches us something grace teaches us how we should live uh, as we reflect this morning each, each first day of the week uh, there's probably no more powerful morning or powerful time during the week uh, than when congregations get together and focus on the cross focus on Jesus focus on what great gift we receive because of, of the death of, of Christ on the cross and of course his resurrection he says, because of this grace, this should help us. This should make it more attractive for us. It should teach us to live in the way that God um, has planned for us to live. Verse 13 says, while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, while we wait for his second coming, grace should affect us so much, should have such an impact on us that it changes how we live and how we think about our lives and how we think about our priorities. Verse 14, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. The cross is a time for much reflection in different areas, but it's certainly a time for us to think about how we have lived up to this point and how we intend to live going forward and how the grace that we receive is going to impact that and how it's going to teach us to be more like Jesus. Let's bow. Father, we're thankful for this time and we're thankful for this uh, very moment that we can consider your son and, and recognize what he's done for us in his death that he died. Father, we're thankful for the grace that's extended through that death and through his resurrection, Father, and we're so thankful that we can remember that uh, from week to week, but certainly we can remember that every day, Father, as we live and, and help us to live our lives, showing thankfulness, showing grace to one another, and, and recognizing that we are uh, ambassadors and that we are teaching others uh, as we live. And, and Father, we're thankful for the great example that you've provided with that. And we take it as a bread that represents your body, we pray that you do so in a pleasing way. In Jesus' name, amen.
continue to remember your son and your Savior, Father. We are mindful of the blood that was shed, Father. We are so thankful that uh, that you loved us so much that you provided your son to, uh, to die for us, to shed his blood, uh, so that blood can cleanse us from our sins, Father. Thank you for the cup of the best terror. In Jesus' name, amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for our blessings, lives, and love as we join. Now it's time to give part of it. Give back part of what they have given us. Let's do so in a way that we can make it easy for us now. together while we stand and the main standing is Danny brings our, our scripture reading before the lesson. I'm in the way, the bright and shining way. I'm in the glory land way. Telling the world that Jesus saves today. Yes, I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. Heaven is near and the way goeth clearer for. I'm in the glory land way. Bless to the call, the gospel call today. Get in the glory land way. Wonders come home, oh, hasten to obey. I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. Heaven is nearer and the way groweth clearer for. I'm in the glory land way. Onward I go, rejoicing in his love. I'm in the glory land way. Soon I shall see him in my home above. Oh, I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land 
He speaks the drooping heart to cheer, oh hear the voice of Jesus. Sweetest note in seraph song, sweetest name on mortal tongue, sweetest carol ever sung, Jesus blessed Jesus. All glory to the dying Lamb, I now believe in Jesus. I love the blessed Savior's name, I love the name of Jesus. Sweetest note in seraph song, sweetest name on mortal tongue, sweetest carol ever sung, Jesus blessed Jesus. His name dispels my guilt and fear no other name but Jesus. Us. Oh, how my soul delights to hear the charming name of Jesus. Sweetest note in seraph song, sweetest name on mortal tongue, sweetest carol ever sung, Jesus blessed Jesus. And when to that bright world of hope we rise to see our Jesus, we'll sing around of love, his name, the name of Jesus. Sweetest note in seraph song, sweetest name on mortal tongue, sweetest carol ever sung, Jesus blessed Jesus. We'll be uh, reading out of 2 Samuel uh, 13, uh, 37, uh, 39. Okay. But Absalom fled and went to Tamal, the son of Amon, king of Geshur. And David mourned for his son day after day. So Absalom fled and went to Geshur was there three years and the spirit of the king longed to go out to, to Aswan because he was comforted about him since he was dead. Maybe it's easy. Good morning. It's great to see you today. Uh, now, we had a really great vacation last week over in the mountains. A lot of fun. Not too much to complain about there. Uh, and then we even visited a very nice congregation last Sunday. But it just wasn't Slicer Street. It wasn't home. Hope you feel that way whenever you, you uh, have to be out. You know, there, there are a ton of nice congregations out there to visit when we're on vacations and, uh, you know, taking trips. But it's just not quite the same, is it? It's just not home. Uh, and I'm, I'm thankful to be here with you today. Uh, 2 Samuel 13, we're actually going to be going through chapter 18, so a pretty long uh, section to cover here today, just hitting some high points. Uh, we're getting pretty close toward the end of David's life, just a, a couple more weeks left of this, and then we'll move on to something else. Now, over the past few months, the English royal family has been all over the news. You've probably seen some of that stuff on TV. Now, I don't care one bit about that at all. Oh, why should I care about some filthy, stinking rich family across an ocean? 
I don't care. They don't matter to me one bit. And thankfully, Sarah doesn't care about that stuff either, so that junk is not on our TV at all. But there's no doubt about it. This stuff does matter to a lot of people. A lot of people are very, very interested in this stuff. Uh, I guess the Prince Harry and his American wife, they, they moved to Los Angeles, I think it was, to get away from the royal family. They didn't want to live that life anymore. Um, don't know why, but they, they decided to leave it. And then they did this interview with Oprah, and they aired all the, the dirty laundry for everybody to see. Now look, I, I'm no expert family counselor or anything, but it doesn't take a genius to figure out that doing a worldwide TV interview with Oprah about your family problems isn't such a good idea. Uh, not that Oprah would really want to do one about your family. I don't think Oprah cares about who left the empty jug of milk in the fridge or anything, you know. But people watched this story. A lot of people watched it. Because for whatever reason, the royal family is fascinating to them. Especially when the cracks start to show. Well, I bet that if Oprah was around a few thousand years ago, David's family could have went on and done a big interview with her. And the world would have been fascinated by it. Because their problems were a lot more severe than a son moving to America and telling some family secrets. They had some very real problems. Now, in our last sermon in this series, a couple weeks ago, if you can remember that, we looked at the consequences of David's sin, or at least some of them, uh, his sin with Bathsheba. And you might remember the Lord told David that evil would rise up from his own household and the sword would never depart from his house. And that certainly came true. Every word of it. As David's oldest son, Amnon, was in love with his half-sister, Tamar. And really, it was more like lust. He had his way with her, then he tossed her aside like garbage. He completely ruined her life. And then Tamar's full brother, Absalom, heard of this. He murdered his brother Amnon. Now I have no doubt that at that point the consequences of David's sin were far greater than he was prepared to pay. But unfortunately they wouldn't stop there. Because today we continue to look at the sad state of David's life in this family. We're going to start by reading what Danny just read again, verses 37 through 39. Let's bow together in prayer before we do that. Heavenly Father, God, thank you for your blessings. Thank you for today. Thank you for allowing us to be your church, your people. And thank you for letting us be gathered together around your throne to worship you. God, help us as we do that today. Guide our words, our thoughts, and our actions as we praise you. And as we study from your word today, God, help us to look at this example of David's life and his family and help us to learn from it. Give us wisdom as we try to apply these lessons to our own lives. God, and, and help us to look a little bit more like your son every day. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. All right, chapter 13, verses 37 through 39. But Absalom fled and went to Talmai, the son of Amahad, king of Geshur. And David mourned for his son day after day. So Absalom fled and went to Geshur, and there lived three years. And the spirit of the king longed to go out to Absalom, because he was comforted about Amnon since he was dead. Okay, so Absalom, David's second oldest son, fled to Geshur to live with Talmai. Now Talmai was uh, Absalom's grandfather on his mother's side. We don't know exactly why Absalom went to him. There are a few, I think, pretty good guesses that might be true. Uh, maybe they had a special relationship together. That happened. Ha happens a lot between grandfather and grandson. Uh, maybe Absalom was looking for a stronger father figure than David was. Certainly David wasn't fulfilling that role very well at this time. Maybe he was looking for protection that he thought he could gain there with his grandfather. Or maybe he just wanted to get as far away from his father as possible. And I can't say that I would blame him too much about that. But either way, Absalom stayed there in Geshur for three years. And it seems like every day during that time, David's heart longed to go out and see his son. He desperately wanted to see Absalom's face because he still loved him. But he did. He never went to see Absalom. Why not? I mean, Absalom was a special son to David. 
We're told that. Scripture says that from the very beginning, like it talks about how beautiful of a child Absalom was. He was a handsome, handsome young man. And you can almost picture David just filled with pride over this son he has. And now his oldest son Amnon is dead, and Absalom was left as the oldest. So why didn't David go and see him and try to fix this broken relationship? I don't know, maybe David would have said something like, I can't do that. I'm the king after all, I have a reputation to uphold. What about my pride? I can't lower myself to go see my son. And so David did nothing. And nothing is the worst thing you can do. In chapter 14, Joab uh, David's commander took, took a page out of Nathan the prophet's book. You remember when Nathan came to David after the sin with Bathsheba and told him a parable describing what David had done? Well, Joab did the same thing. He had a woman go to David, telling him this story about one of her sons murdering another of her sons. And the trick worked just as well the second time as it did the first. David pardoned this young man who had committed murder. And then the woman basically said, then why won't you do the same thing for your son Absalom? I mean, all the people want him to return. We want the prince back. So if you would pardon my son, why won't you pardon your own? King, forgive him and let him come home. Okay, David listened. He relented. He sent Joab to return Absalom to Jerusalem. And this text really should be a beautiful one as Absalom is allowed to return home. This really should mirror the story of the prodigal son as David is reunited with his son but it just doesn't live up to what it should be. Let's keep reading chapter 14, verses 21 through 24. Then the king said to Joab, Behold now, I grant this. Go, bring back the young man Absalom. And Joab fell on his face to the ground and paid homage and blessed the king. And Joab said, Today your servant knows that I have found favor in your sight, my lord the king, and that the king has granted the request of his servant. So Joab arose and went to Geshur and brought Absalom to Jerusalem. Okay, so far so good, right? But then listen to this heartbreaking verse. Verse 24, And the king said, Let him dwell apart in his own house. He is not to come into my presence. So Absalom lived apart in his own house and did not come into the king's presence. How tragic is that verse? That is so sad. I mean, this was David's son. David's son that he had been proud of from day one. Y yes, he had done wrong, no doubt about that, but this was his son. And David's spirit longed to see Absalom. He, he wanted this from the depths of his soul, but David wouldn't even allow him in the palace. The father of the prodigal son waited on the horizon for his son. He waited with arms wide open and ran out and embraced him when he saw him. David waited with his back turned, refusing to even look at his son. So he wasn't prepared to punish his son for the murder he committed, but he also wasn't humble enough to forgive him. And so David did nothing. And nothing is the worst thing you can do. Chapter 14, verse 28 says that Absalom lived in Jerusalem for two full years without seeing his father. So he had lived three years with his grandfather before that. So now five years it has been since he has been uh, welcomed in the presence of his father. And this was taking its toll on Absalom. Absalom wanted to see his dad. So he tried to get his father's attention, but that didn't work. He tried to get Joab's attention, but again, he was being ignored so desperate to see his father, eventually he had his servants set Joab's barley fields on fire to get somebody to notice him. And it worked. It finally worked. David finally called for his son to come into his presence after five long years. Now this would be an opportunity to talk, to clear the air, to bury their problems, and to finally reconcile. Well, let's see what happened in verse 33. Then Joab went to the king and told him, and David summoned Absalom. 
So he came to the king and bowed himself on his face to the ground before the king, and the king kissed Absalom. Now that sounds really nice, doesn't it? Problem solved. Absalom came in, he bowed down before his father, he showed some humility, and David kissed his son. That sounds so sweet. It wasn't. Because what you have to realize is that this kiss was just royal protocol. This is just, I mean, it's the equivalent to a handshake. It's cold. It's distant. After five long years of being separated, David essentially shook his son's hand, and that was about all he gave him. Imagine your very own son had messed up royally. No pun intended on that. But, and it had driven a wedge between you two, emotionally, spiritually, mentally, physically, in every way. There was this distance between you. And desperate for reconciliation, your son takes the first step. He comes to you, obviously nervous. He's shifting back and forth on his way. He's sweating profusely. This has left him a wreck. And you shake his hand and leave. Don't say another word to him. That's it. That is just not enough. I mean, this was time for communication. David should have talked to his son, Absalom. He should have said, son, you have sinned. And, and we've got to get past this. Now, I had a part to play in it as, in as well. I did wrong, and so did you. So let's find a way so we can forgive each other and become father and son again. But David didn't do any of that. Again, he did nothing. And nothing is the worst thing you can do. After this pathetic interaction, Absalom had finally had enough. Chapter 15, he begins a revolt against his father. He made himself visible through the entire country. He'd ride in his royal chariot, surrounded himself with horses and 50 men who would run before him. What he was doing was basically throwing a parade for himself every day. And for four years, he stole the people's hearts away by telling the people he would come in contact with exactly what they wanted to hear. And it worked. You know, it still works in politics today to tell people what they want to hear, and it worked just as well back then. After four years of this, he came up with a plan. He told David he wanted to go down to fulfill a vow he had made while he lived in Hebron. Now, David should have known this was all nonsense. It had been six years since Absalom lived there, but David continued to be a pushover at this point in his life, and he allowed his son to leave. But what Absalom was really doing was establish, establishing Hebron as his new capital. And it was brilliant, actually. Absalom really was a son to be proud of. This guy was, a, he was a handsome in appearance, and he was a very, very intelligent young man. Because Hebron was David's original capital. And a lot of the people still weren't happy that David moved to Jerusalem. Absalom was born there, so this was the hometown son returning home to set things right. And it was far enough away from Jerusalem that Absalom's revolt could gain some traction before David's soldiers could intervene. Let's keep reading. Chapter 15, verses 10 through 17. But Absalom sent secret messengers throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, as soon as you hear the sound of the trumpet, then say, Absalom is king in Hebron. With Absalom went 200 men from Jerusalem who were invited guests, and they went in their innocence and knew nothing. And while Absalom was offering the sacrifices, he sent for Ahithophel the Gilonite, David's counselor from his city Gilo. And the conspiracy grew strong, and the people with Absalom kept increasing. And a messenger came to David, saying, the hearts of the men of Israel have gone after Absalom. Then David said to all his servants who were with him at Jerusalem, Arise and let us flee, or else there will be no escape for us from Absalom. Go quickly, lest he overtake us quickly and bring down ruin on us and strike the city with the edge of the sword. And the king's servant said to the king, Behold, your servants are ready to do whatever my lord the king decides. And the king went out and all his household after him. And the king left ten concubines to keep the house. And the king went out and all the people after him, and they halted at the last house. Skip ahead to chapter 16, verse 15. 
Now Absalom and all the people, the men of Israel, came to Jerusalem, and the Hithophel with them. So Absalom arrived. And then verses 20 through 22. Then Absalom said to Ahithophel, Give your counsel. What should we do? Ahithophel said to Absalom, Go into your father's concubines, whom he has left to keep the house, and all Israel will hear that you have made yourself a stench to your father. And the hands of all who are with you will be strengthened. So they pitched a tent for Absalom on the roof. And Absalom went into his father's concubines in the sight of all Israel. So Absalom starts this revolt and comes marching in to Jerusalem. Now David was afraid, so he got his men. He left the city. Do you think the man after God's own heart that we have been reading about for so long, the one who stood up against the giant, the one who spared King Saul's life, the one who trusted in God every day of his life, would have fled his own city out of fear? That just doesn't sound like the same guy to me. But his sin with Bathsheba had just wrecked him. He had grown weak. His faith had been shaken. And he fled from his own home, his own city. Soon Absalom and his men entered. and He asked his father's former advisor what his next move should be. And Ahithophel said, your father's left behind ten concubines. Sleep with them in the sight of all the people. This will show that you have taken your father's place as king. It'll show you're not afraid of him, and it'll show that all ties between you two have been broken. So they pitched a tent on the roof of the palace, and the deed was done. It's ironic that it's the same roof where all this mess had started as David watched Bathsheba bathe. You remember what God said to David back in chapter 12? Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of the sun. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. Everything, every single thing had happened just as God had said it would. David's entire life had come crashing down because of his sin. Now this must have seemed like the lowest point for David. Maybe he was thinking, well, at least it can't get any worse. Yes, it could. David had one more thing to lose in chapter 18. Verse 1. Then David mustered the men who were with him and set over them commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds. So David was finally prepared to go to war against his own son. And then verses 6 through 15. So the army went out into the field against Israel. When it says Israel, that's Absalom's men. And the battle was fought in the forest of Ephraim. And the men of Israel were defeated there by the servants of David. And the loss there was great on that day, 20,000 men. The battle spread over the face of all the country, and the forest devoured more people that day than the sword. And Absalom happened to meet the servants of David. Absalom was riding on his mule, and the mule went under the thick branches of a great oak, and his head caught fast in the oak, and he was suspended between heaven and earth, while the mule that was under him went on. And a certain man saw it and told Joab, Behold, I saw Absalom hanging in an oak. And Joab said to the man who had told him, What, you saw him? Why then did you not strike him there to the ground? I would have been glad to give you ten pieces of silver and a belt. But the man said to Joab, even if I felt in my hand the weight of a thousand pieces of silver, I would not reach out my hand against the king's son. For in our hearing, the king commanded you and Abishai and Ittai, he said, for my sake, protect the young man Absalom. On the other hand, if I had dealt treacherously against his life, and there is nothing hidden from the king, then you yourself would have stood a wound. And Joab said, I will not waste time like this with you. And he took three javelins in his hand, and thrust them into the heart of Absalom while he was still alive in the earth. And ten young men, Joab's armor bearers, surrounded Absalom and struck him and killed him. So Absalom, David's pride and joy, 
became trapped in the tree. This beautiful hair that had been, uh, that had been su such a pride to him became his undoing. Joab, David's commander, finally found Absalom hanging there defenseless, but there was a problem. You see, David had commanded them to protect him. Uh, again, before David sinned with Bathsheba, there is no way that Joab would have disobeyed David's orders. But things were different now. David was different. And so Joab thrust three spears into Absalom's heart, and he commanded his armor bearers to do the same. The king's oldest son was dead. Now, Absalom had been a problem. He had caused nothing but heartache for David for years now. But he was still David's son. And then we see this, the very end of chapter 18, our final passage for today. Verse 31 through 33. And behold, the Cushite came, and the Cushite said, Good news for my lord the king. For the Lord has delivered you this day from the hand of all who rose up against you. The king said to the Cushite, Is it well with the young man Absalom? David was still concerned about his son. And the Cushite answered, May the enemies of my lord the king and all who rise up against you for evil be like that young man. And the king was deeply moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And this has got to be one of the saddest statements in all of Scripture. And as he went, he said, O oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would I have died instead of you? O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Those spears that were thrust into Absalom might as well have been thrust into David's heart. He had faced his final great loss. Now, obviously, this was all punishment sent by God because it had played out exactly as God said it would. But reading through these heartbreaking stories of David's life, you can't help but see how David fueled the dissension, the hatred, and the rebellion by his own inactivity and failure to do anything. Please, let the same never be said of us, parents. Look, will we have children like Absalom? Probably not. But there's, that's not to say there won't be issues between us and our children. Sometimes our kids will disappoint us, and sometimes our kids will even break our hearts. Now, I haven't been through that yet. My kids are four and eight. Now, they do kid-like things, but I know the teenage years are coming, and I know that the adult years are coming after that. Those years can bring anything. Some of you have been through that. And there may still be rifts between you and your children. Whether they're teenagers or they're 50 years old, it doesn't matter. I think we need to see David as, as an example of how not to handle these problems. First, we, we've got to, to avoid the trap David fell into. We cannot do nothing. We cannot just stand on the sidelines with our hands in our pockets. There's a trend going around in parenting where a lot of folks are very hands-off when it comes to their children. And you've all seen this, of course. But they'll let their kids do whatever they want to do. Children can do no wrong, and if they do, well, the parents will bail them out with no consequences paid. But it's going to bring about a generation of adults who are spoiled, self-centered, and flat-out rotten. We parents have to do our job. We've got to step in when these kind of things take place. Now, obviously, we can go too far in the other direction there. We don't want to be overbearing or overcritical, but we cannot just stand by and do nothing. David watched as Absalom killed his brother, and David did nothing. Absalom went to live with his grandfather. David so longed to see him, but David did nothing. David allowed Absalom to return, return to Jerusalem, but he refused to see him. And David did nothing. And he eventually met with him, but only gave him the equivalent of a handshake. And David did nothing. And it was the worst thing he could have possibly done. What if David had intervened at the very beginning? What if he had got involved in Absalom's life? Would things have turned out differently? I don't know, but maybe. When we see our children make mistakes, and believe me, they will, we have got to get involved. 
Not in an overbearing or overcritical way, but we have to take some form of action. Here's the action David should have taken. He should have admitted his own fault in the situation. Because wasn't David to blame for so much of this? Now, I'm not excusing Absalom for his actions. He had made his choices, and he was responsible for what he did. But this all began with David's sin. He set the example that Absalom followed. And then David's indecision and inability to react worsened the whole situation. David should have taken the blame for the mistakes he made. But instead, he just let Absalom suffer at a distance. When our children make mistakes, I think we've got to be willing to take blame for whatever part we may have played in. Now, that's not to excuse them of their wrongdoing or let them off the hook. But if we set the example that they followed, we better be willing to own up to it. If we failed to step in when we needed to, we better be willing to accept that responsibility. And if we failed to give them whatever support they needed, we better be willing to take that blame. Don't have so much pride that you can't apologize to your own children if they deserve it. Finally, David should have had an open conversation with his son about everything that had happened. Yes, he did finally meet with Absalom, and he kissed him. But that was it. That's the only interaction we're told about. David needed to open up the line of communication with his son. Yes, he needed to take responsibility for the part he played, but he also needed to say, Absalom, you have sinned. What you have done is evil. And we're going to have to find a way to work through this. So here are our solutions, Absalom. Here's how we can move past this. When our children make mistakes, we have to communicate with them. We've got to have the real conversations. Now, I know it's easier just to hand down the punishment and not really talk about it, but that didn't work so well for David. Have real lines of communication open with your children. And don't be afraid to tell them where they've gone wrong. Get involved in their lives. Now, this is all a lesson that I hope you never have to practice. I hope your children never break your heart the way Absalom did to David. But unfortunately, this is reality sometimes. This is real life. And real life is full of problems. Thankfully, though, the good news is the same as it's been through this entire series. No matter what trials we face, no matter what giants come into our lives, we never have to face them alone. Whether it's a problem that is thrust upon us, whether it's one of our own making, or even if it comes from our own children, God promises to be with us every step of the way. You don't have to face your heartbreaks alone. Do you have that assurance that God is with you the whole way? Do you know for a fact he's with you? Have you responded to his offer of grace so that you can have God alive in your life? If you need to do that for the first time today by being united with Christ in baptism, or you need to, to respond to him for the thousandth time through repentance. Today, if you have a need, please, won't you come forward as we stand and we sing. There's not a friend like the lonely Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. None else could heal all our souls' diseases. No, not one. No, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. No friend like him is so high and holy. No, not one. No, not one. And yet no friend is so meek and lowly. No, not one. No, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the 
day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. There's not an hour that he is not near us. No, not one. No, not one. No night so dark but his love can cheer us. No, not one. No, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. Great to be together today. We're going to sing number 290, Shine. Jesus shine. We'll sing this and have our dismissal prayer. Have a blessed week, everybody. Lord, the light of your love is shining in the midst of the darkness, shining. Jesus, light of the world, shine upon us. Set us free by the truth you now bring us. Shine on me. Shine on me. Shine, Jesus, shine. Fill this land with the Father's glory. Place, Spirit, place. Set our hearts on. and mercy send forth your word Lord and let there be light Lord I come to your awesome presence from the shadows into your radiance by the blood I may enter your brightness search me try me consume all my darkness Shine on me, shine on me, shine, Jesus, shine, fill this land with the Father's glory, place, spirit, place, set our hearts on fire, glory. Flood the nations with grace and mercy. Send forth your word, Lord, and let there be light. Let's pray. God, we thank you for letting us be here today to gather and sing and worship your word, your name, and learn more on your word. And God, we ask you please be with the sick that's been mentioned this morning. Please help them get back to health, and please be with us this week as we go about our day and we take your word with us. And God, make let your son down across for us. In Christ's name, pray. Amen.